for there is none that can deliver you from you. You are the God that control the earth, the earth and the sea and everything that's on it. Lord, teach us a word. Make known to us your purpose. Today we have another insightful topic. Lord, show us with the help of your Holy Spirit what you want us to teach. That in everything, only your name and your name alone shall be praised. Today we have another teaching who says the beat and his army defeated. So God is showing us tonight and not only will he defeat all the armies of the enemy, he will put them to total sleep at Mount Gilead. Today we are still under our topic, Understanding Prophecy. Understanding Prophecy and today we focus on the book of Revelation. Lord, as we look into your word, grant us the grace to understand it fully, to make your word a reality, and to bring about the wisdom that only you can bring to us. Tonight, we read from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, and it says, The Holy Spirit, I saw the angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all that live midst of heaven. Come, gather together for the supper of the great feast. For the supper of the great God. So many Christians run into confusion. Is this the marriage feast of the Lamb? If this is the marriage feast of the Lamb, I don't want to part of it. No. This is not the marriage feast of the Lamb. This is the feast on earth over the enemy that rose up against God. And what is the preeminence pattern of the startup of this program. It started with the kings of the air taking counsel together as we discover in Psalm 2. Let's read Psalm 2 so we understand why the preparation of this event was so important. Psalm 2. What does this say? I read From verse 1, it says, In Messiah, Sion, and Judah, why does the nation rage? Rage is a state of uncontrollable anger. Why is the nation angry? What brings about their anger? And the great and the anger and the take and the ruler take cancer together. Why is the rulers of the earth gathering together? And for what purpose is their gathering? Then it explains further in verse 2. He said, What is the nation angry? And the people is plotting a vain thing. First, the nation are angry. And the only thing they can think about is something that is unimaginable, something that cannot happen. That is what their plans is about. A vain thing. Something that no man on earth can imagine about doing something that is not even feasible in the first place. And what are the kings of the earth themselves? They set themselves and the ruler took counsel. They gather together in a meeting, endless meeting. What are they discussing at this particular end of the world? So their discussion is against God. So they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed son, Jesus Christ. And what are they saying? Let us break their vows in pieces and cast away the cord of God from over us. That is the plan. The plan is to break the vows of God from over humanity, to take the earth for themselves so that the people can be under them rather than under God. Because all that a king wants is to have total authority. And this total authority, they look how sweet it is because they enjoy it under the reign of the Antichrist. Where you are king and king in your region, the people has no voice. Only the government make law and enforce it with vigorous authority over the people. And now, 
The reign of such tyranny is about to end. No tyrant wants his reign to come to an end fast. And as a result of this reign coming to an end, the anger is growing. And this tyrant is saying, enough is enough. This man that is coming to put an end to all our tyrant reign, we will not allow him. So they gather together. Whenever you see two wicked people are united, it's not for good things. It's for evil. So these kings of the earth and their rulers, the reason why they are gathered together is not for good things. They are not gathering together to shake hands with the king of the earth and say, sorry, we hand over our authority on a platter of gold to the king. No, this is not the reason of their gathering. They gather together against God because even they are not ready to surrender to God. They are not ready to surrender their authority. If you have cast out demons before, you understand that you don't cast out demons by shaking hands with them. You have to forcefully drove them out because they are not willing to leave. So that is how it happens, even on the last day. These people are not willing to go quietly. They are ready to fight for the earth, which they want to come to love, and for the kingdom which the Antichrist has handed over to them. The king, king himself will gather themselves together, and they are going to gather themselves with their army, with their tank, to fight against somebody that is coming <laughs> with all the same. Because those that are with him are called chosen and faithful. He knew they would fight. He is also prepared for battle. To confront them. And the battle came in Psalm 2. Before we read about his own side of preparation, let's read about the earthly preparation for this battle. In Psalm 2, he let us understand. From verse 2, he said, this, in from verse 2, the ending, to bless the Lord and bless the Lord. What are they saying? Let us break away from that. Let us remove his control from our heads. And let's break it to pieces. Let's cast his cords of control from upon us. He has been controlling the spread that is happening to us. He has been controlling the heat of the sun. He has been controlling darkness. He controlled the demon army. He controls all these things that has happened to the earth. Time has come for us to take a step. Time has come for us to take risk. They gather the people together because a king is not as powerful as the people he led. So the people are being deceived here. They are being used as trophy to fight against their Lord. And though this is exactly what the event that will take place at the final return of the Lord Jesus Christ, these people will be used as a trophy to the devil. To contend against God. And they are going to say within themselves, let us cast away the cord from us. And but the Bible says, the man that is sat in heaven, which is the most high himself, will look at this effort of men and they will burst into laughter. Because it is funny. This is vanity plan. How are you going to fight the man who moved you from clay? It's like a pot saying to the potter, I am going to contend with you. I'm going to remove your authority from my head. When the potter can decide to use the pot to fetch water, we're able to break the pot to pieces whenever he sees it. This is exactly what we are to God. But he who starts in heaven will look at them and burst into laughter. Why is these people plotting an impossible task? Why is the rulers of the earth imagining something that is vain? Are you going to attack the Lord? Oh, obviously, he's coming from the earth. So we, we have our Air Force, we have our jet bomber, we have our atomic weapons. We can launch against him from all the four continents of the earth. Let's kill him before he gets to the earth so we can take the world for ourselves. <laughs> for the most high, he who sat in heaven will laugh. The most high has them in derision. Can you launch weapon against the sun? Can you launch your atomic bomb against the sun and expect the sun to die? So what are you thinking about? Because he who sat in heaven will laugh. Because the most high himself, <coughs> he will have them in derision. So the Lord himself will hold these people in derision. The reason why he's holding them in derision, no killing, is because he shall speak to them in his anger. Because he is the one that came. Remember John 3.16. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. That if what we need to do as human beings is to believe in him so that we will not perish but have everlasting life. But instead of the kings of the earth coming to this reality, they decide that their only course of action was to break his cross of death and to hold the earth captive and master for themselves. That they should remove their bonds of control from God rather than obey his word. And the Bible makes clear to us in the book of First Samuel, that to obey is better than sacrifice, to hackle than the fatness of a ram. But these kings of the earth are not willing to give in to obedience. No, how can we obey? We will not. We will rather contend with God. We will fight against sin and we will take the earth's ransom for ourselves. <laughs> but the Lord will look at this as a foolish plot because he is the I am that I am. And the people that are with him are called chosen and faithful. So, with righteousness, he judge and executes judgment. And he does make war in righteousness. So, how are you going to contend with the man that make war in righteousness? Which by whom the whole face, but before whose face, the whole tribes of the earth flew to him. And there was found no place for him. How are you going to contend? Oh, the armies of the world will gather together. Their regional commander will radio the other one. And they are going to contend with those kings. But let's go to the superation of this man they are trying to fight against. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 63. Let's see who is this man that the kings of the earth are gathering against. And what are their chances of survival? Isaiah 63 from verse 1. What does it say? The Lord, the Lord in judgment and salvation. And he said, Who is this that cometh from Sidon with a dye garment of gold? Who is this? Because even the prophet could not recognize him. And he said, Who is this man that is coming from Eden with a dye garment of gold? And the man had to reply, this is the one that is blonder in his appearance. And frankly, in the greatness of his strength, to move faster than the speed of light, he is traveling with the greatness of his strength. Even the speed of light, anything moving faster than the speed of light can penetrate a wall without any impact. Is that what you are trying to contend against? That is the one that is surpassing the greatness of his strength. And who speaks in righteousness is the Lord that speaks in holiness. In his mercy he speaks. That is who they are contending with. And the prophet asks a question. How come when you are white red? I heard the Lord is a shining light, bright and beautiful. Who is your Clothes red. How come your clothes is red instead of white? <laughs> and your garment like the one that shreds the one fat. Because if you shred the one fat of the head, your garment will be sprinkled with fat of the man or the wine. And he is saying to you, How come is your garment not red like somebody that shreds the one fresh of the head? He said, I have given the one fresh of it. The reason why his garment is going to be dyed with blood is because he's going to march upon his enemy. He's not coming with a stained garment from heaven. It was the earth that stained his garment. The blood of the enemies, his slaughter, that stains his garment. And he is going to say, I tried to march away from him and from the people who would be slain. I have given them my of the people there was no one to I may be coming with those who are called chosen and faithful, but I don't need them for this battle. But I will shred the one press of the earth of them. I will shred them in my hand, and I will sprinkle them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my enemy. And I will stain all my robe. The day of vengeance is in my heart. 
is in God. So who do you think of here? With humility, bow your knee in adoration. Don't contend with this man because this is coming. The day of vengeance is in his house because the year of the redeems of the Lord has come. Now look, there was no one to help. And I wonder, there was no one to uphold what is true. Because all the saints are gone. And nobody that is contending on his side, he is coming against the whole world. And he is saying to you, I look, there was no one to help. And I wonder, there was no one to uphold you. Therefore, my own arm brought this man. It is his hand that he will use to deliver the world. And in my fury, he sustains him. He is going to sustain himself in the anger that he has concerning the inhabitants of the world for deliberately choosing to fight God rather than to submit to him. And he said, I will shred the people in my anger. The reason why he is going to shred them in his anger and make them drunk in his fury and brought down their strength to the earth. What? Brought down their strength to the earth? Yes. The ground which they say they want to take over, the earth which they say they did not create, they want to rule over, that is God. Where God is going to come. Let's go back to chapter 2. Let's see the instruction the prophet warned us that we should take, that we should be careful against them. And he says, Then he will speak to them with his word and distress them in his deep displeasure. That is the man speaking to you. And he is saying he is going to speak to you in anger. And that is what that place just told you about. That he would also distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet have I said my things in Zion. God is speaking. On my holy hills of Zion. And I will declare, this is a man. He is not coming just because he wants to intrude in the earth business or affairs. He is coming because the earth that he paid the price for has been given to him. He has paid the bright price of the earth. Both for the wicked and for the righteous. Now he is coming to take possession. To drive away the antichrist, the beast, the armies and all the captains of the world, and the kings of the earth, and take possession of what is his by right. And what is he going to do? He said, I will declare the decree, which the Lord says to me, you are my son. The owner of the universe said, the person that is coming to take over the world is his son. Oh, you king of the earth, why are you there? <laughs> all you rulers, why are you gathering yourself together? The person that laid the foundation of things is the owner. And he is saying that he has given it to him. And he says, you are my son. And the Lord says, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Ask of me. Whatever you need, just ask me. And I will give you these nations for your inheritance. These people that are making noise. They are armor cars, they are machines, the kings, the rulers. I will give them to you for inheritance. So how do you contend with the man whom you are his inheritance. It's like a slave saying to his master, I am your child. It doesn't work. So he said, I will give the nations for you an inheritance, and the ends of the earth will be given to you for what? A possession. And you will have right and authority. Right is authority to break it with the rod of God. He is going to rule the nation with the rod of iron. And you shall dash them to pieces and the pot shall dash it to the ground. Anybody that doesn't want to conform, you will destroy. I have given you that right. Now, therefore, I counsel you, O you kings of the earth, the wise, the instructed, you judges of the earth. Let's serve the Lord with fear. With rejoicing and with trembling. Save the Lord with fear. Rejoice and tremble before his presence. 
when he comes. Because he is not coming for peace. He is coming for vengeance. He is not the same lamb that Aaron was sorting to kill. He was not the same Jesus who has to be hid, hidden away in Egypt. This time, he is coming as the Lord of vengeance. And he is coming to take possession of the world. And to drive away all the wicked from the earth. And to dash the nation to pieces. That is who what he is coming to. The Bible says we should make it to make it for peace. You should not allow me to be angry or you perish in his way when his wrath is to be coming. Now let's go back to our reading. And I will explain, make sense to the book of Revelation where he actually fulfilled those things that he just read about. This book of Revelation is going to teach you that God in his infinite power is going to fulfill all these things as he specified in his word. And he said in Revelation 19 from verse 18 that you make peace of the flesh of sin, the flesh of cattle. This is as a result of what you just read. Because obviously the king of the earth never learned their senses. And they never kissed the son with humility and would trembling offer praises and adoration to him. No. They prepared to fight. And the result of that fight was that the bears were called to gather together to eat the flesh of sin, the flesh of cattle, and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and the flesh of them that sat on them, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great, the flesh, the bears were called upon to feed on them. Because there will be many down slain. The Bible calls it in the book of Isaiah, it says, multitude upon multitude on the valley of decision. Multitude upon multitude. Because the prophet could not even cancel the number. He said, multitude upon multitude on the valley of decision. And the valley of decision is the valley of decision. And he said, then the beast was scattered and the first person. So it is not only humans that took part in this battle. The beast himself, the Antichrist, took part in it. And the first prophet, indeed, he was part of this battle. He's supposed to be a prophet, right? Prophets are not supposed to fight. But he, because he is false, he will gather again. Let's say he said, this man was not too much. So I have special magic to take the earth for ourselves. So we can defeat God. Since we could not defeat him in heaven, we were told that let's defeat him on earth. At least let's have one, one, one of the domain as our own abode. But unfortunately, they will be conquered. Because what we just saw here is that the beast was created, the beast was taken, captured. And the first prophet who walked signs in his presence by which by, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worship his image he was also taken and these two were cast alive and into the lake of fire the lake of fire for many of you that say it doesn't exist you will see it on that day because the beast is going to be thrown into it and so is the first prophet the burning lake of fire burning with brimstone they will be thrown into it so it's not the fire the devil showed you that wasn't burning. <laughs> so we are talking of the lake of fire that burned with brimstone. It burned the devil. They will be thrown. If, they, if it doesn't hurt, God will not throw them into it. So you small, small demon that are deceiving yourself. Oh, fire doesn't burn you. But when you see the real fire, you're going to be burned. And the rest were killed with the sword. They are not thrown. They were told God does not want to waste his time with the rest of the human race. The death with the devil and the antichrist and the false prophets. But the rest of the people were slain with the sword. Which we see from the mat. And what sword are we talking about here? Is it God is going to be exchanging battle eggs or, or shooting grenades? No. The word of God. He is the Christ. Remember, you are dust. By that same word of God, you will turn from the dust. And by that same word, you will return to dust. 
He declared it. That is his soul that proceeds from his mouth. The word of God. The word of God is the soul. It proceeds from the mouth of Christ himself. And what is it saying? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And with it, he shall smit the nation. He's not going to smit them with gun, grenade, brazier, sword, or bullets. No. He's going to smit them with the word of his mouth. And he's going to decree the word of God. And by decreeing the word of God, he's going to cancel all the inhabitants of the earth. He's going to cancel all the inhabitants of the earth and let God has dominion over the earth. By so doing, all the inhabitants of the earth that remain, that were not natural, the Bible said they were gathered, not by choice. They were profane with unnecessary zeal to contend against God. And because of this zeal, they became that's why the book we just read warned you that you should serve the Lord with humility. You should bow your knees unto the mighty Lord so that he will not be angry or you will perish when his wrath is taken upon you. Those who receive the mark of the beast and those who watch his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire. It is not only the first prophet who walks signs in the first book. If you see those that have the mark of the beast and who have his image, but these two were cast into the lake of fire when they see the Lord. But the rest were killed with the sword, which proceed from the mark of the beast who sat on the earth. And that sword is the word of God. So the word of God is sharper, as the Bible says, than any sword that was ever created. So with it, many nations will be wounded and many will be killed. And that same word of God is what you have today. It is not something strange. It is the soul of the spirit. And that is the same word that will be used to smit all nations. And all the best will be seen in the flesh. That was distributed for the harvest. Why they were called upon to eat the flesh. They were not called because to just come and fly and go. They were called to eat the flesh of kings, to eat the flesh of commanders, to eat the flesh of those who worship the beast and those who collect his mark, who gather against the Lord and against his anointed of power. Remember what the Bible warned. He said, He that lead into captivity we go into captivity. He that keep by the sword, by sword shall give his soul. He that split a man's blood, by man shall his blood. So be careful. Mark this as a child of God. Be wise. Do not cross the old land now. Satan bound now at this point. He was not thrown into the lake of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet. He was simply bound for a thousand years. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the portfolio. And a great chain in his hand, and he had laid hold on the dragon, the ancient serpent. That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. At this point in time, Satan is not totally destroyed. He is suspended for a thousand years. Now, evil is taken away so that man will not have excuse before the thousand years is over. Remember, there is going to be a new heaven. But at this point in time, there is no yet a new heaven. There is not yet a new earth. All these things will be created within these thousand years. But for these thousand years to be accomplished, Satan is taken out of order. The Antichrist and the false prophets are in the lake of fire, so they cannot trouble anybody. The devil is bound for a thousand years. And he was cast into the bottomless pit. And shut up and set a seal on him that while he is there in the bottomless pit, so that he should not deceive the nation anymore. The things, so when the deception of the nation, when people have been deceived, 
where the government has been deceived, when the kings of the earth have been deceived. People wonder where are all these things coming from. It's coming from the man, the devil, that ocean serpent that deceived the whole world. And he himself at this time is thrown into the bottomless pit and will shut up and there is a pool upon him, warning him not to deceive the nation until the thousand years were finished. But after this thing, he must be loosed a little while. After a thousand years, will the devil be loosed? Yes. He's going to be loosed. We'll see the difference between the reign of wickedness and the reign of the righteousness before he will be finally thrown into the, into the reign of the righteousness. Remember, the devil does not join the Antichrist and the false prophet for the 1,000 years. For that 1,000 years, the Antichrist and the false prophet are in hell, committed in the lake of fire that born with fires and brimstone. And the devil is not yet added to them. He is in the bottomless pit, locked up with chains, and seal is put upon him over the distance that he cannot from there speak to the heart of the king, speak to the heart of men, convince anybody to do what is wrong. He will no longer have that power. That authority will be taken away from him. But the rest of the dead is not right. What? I thought this time the end has come. That many people that believe in the second coming that the whole flesh has raised. No. This point in time, God is dealing solely on the saints and those who died a righteous death, which is also part of the first resurrection. But the rest of the dead who died by whichever means has not risen yet. So they will still remain on the earth until this year is completed. But the rest of the dead did not die again until the thousand years was finished. And if the thousand years was not finished, they will not rise. And this is the first resurrection not the second. All these things we'll be talking about from the beginning, the rapture of the saints, the breaking away of the power of the dead, the righteous death breaking away, the mantle assessing the doors of heaven. These are within the mind of the first resurrection. They are not the second resurrection. So, blessed and holy is he who took part in the first Resurrection over such the second death has no power. You know why? Because they don't have to contend with sin. Lucifer is bound and sealed. He cannot trick anybody with sin. Evil thoughts cannot come to your mind because all the demons are gone. And the devil who deceived mankind is taken out of the world and is sealed. He cannot deceive anybody anymore. And therefore, for that 1,000 years, it's a 1,000 years of peace because all obstacles is taken out of the way. But the dead who are even wicked are still on the earth. They have not risen. And that's why God is saying, blessed is he that took part in the first resurrection because the second dead do not have power over them. They will not be judged. None of them will be cast into the lake of fire. But the rest of the dead and those who receive the mark of the beast who were slain in the battle of Megiddo, they will not rise yet. They will remain in their grave until the thousand years is finished. And that thousand years, they will not enjoy a Satan free one that we, the saints, will enjoy. A Satan, a world that is free from Satan, that is free from sin, that is free from all kind of thoughts that is evil. Such world, they will not have access to it until the thousand years is complete. And the rest of the day did not rise until this thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. And blessed and holy is he who took part in the first resurrection. Over such, death has no power. The second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with that shows you the people that take part in this first resurrection are only the saints. 
the sense which are the church. So this is not the resurrection of the Old Testament sense. This is the resurrection of only the king that prays, the church. The Old Testament saints were servants, so they were not part of the church. So this false resurrection are strictly for the king and priest until they are resurrected. So they were completed. And they shall reign with him a thousand years. Only the church and the matter to the pale of tribulation will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then Satan rebellion comes. Now, when the thousand years has expired, he will be loosed. He will be loosed. Satan will be released from his prison. And he will go to the seat, the nation, which are on the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. We know who Gog are. And we know who Magog are. Gog was a Magog and the son of Sebastian. So we know where, which tribe. And therefore, to gather them together in battle, whose number is as the sand in the seashore, is not tired of battle. Remember, the Antichrist and his rebellion was crushed. Now Satan is gathering his own Gog and Magog together, and all the inhabitants of the demons of the sea that dwells in the four corners of the earth, together for battle against God. <laughs> but sometimes, then, with those out of the seed the nation, which are in the four corners of the earth, God and Abraham, to gather them together, whose number is as the sand in the sea shore. And they went forth to the breadth of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the sun, and the beloved city. Remember the rest of the dead were not killed. Remember, apart from those who went to Magidon, the inhabitants of the nation were still living. But Satan is taken away. So there is no more deception. Now, we want to point out one fact. When you remove Satan from the earth, the people who convinced him were allowed to still live on the earth, they still fell. Man is a fallen man. And these people were, every excuse for sin was taken out. But when Satan still rise, he was able to deceive people. Even to the extent that they were in number like the sun in the seashore. And this is the corners of the earth, which are Gog and Magog, the nation that live at the extreme end of the earth, the four corners of the world. And to gather them together, they even to the extent they surround the camp of the saints. Let notify that these people that were deceived, they are not part of the saints. They were not the saints, the righteous saints. They were not part of the saints that were in the city. The saints dwells in the city of Christ. Christ is the king. And these nations were angry because Christ is going to rule over the people. And the people with anger and fury. And this is the great ruling power that death is only for the sinner and not for the righteous. And this particular reign of Christ, people call it the worst reign ever. But it's the best way because sin is taken away. There is no room for error. And if you commit sin, you receive instant judgment. And that is exactly the end. But these nations at the four corners of the earth somehow was not happy. When Satan rose up from the deep, he focused on them. Though the gong were forcefully gathered together for battle against Christ, not all of them. Therefore, Magog and God was the target of Satan when he rose up to gather them together for battle against the sun. And they surrounded the camp of the sun and the beloved city. They don't need, God didn't need to fight them. Remember, the authority has been given them to, to him. That God said, Ask of me, I will give you the beating for inheritance and the utmost part of the earth for your possession. All you need is God just to say a word. But this time, he doesn't even need a word. Fire came down from heaven and then all of it. That was the end of Satan and his rebellion. Fire came from heaven and 
And the devil who deceived them was cast into what? The lake of fire. You see, those who followed the devil were destroyed by fire. But the man who deceived them could not be killed in fire. So he was taken and cast into the lake of fire that burns with fires and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night. So who we are cast now? We have already the beast and the antichrist inside the lake of fire. Now the devil had just come to join them 1,000 years later. The beast and the antichrist, they are still there because they are spiritual beings. They are immortal beings. They live forever. So they don't die. And so after 1,000 years, the devil is thrown to them. So they are not taken. But what happened to the rest of these deceived people? What happened to the rest of those birds that are wicked? They have not still joined the devil yet in the lake of fire. Now, next week, we are going to be focusing on the judgment, the white throne judgment, where the judgment will be given to the saints. Today, I don't want to make school talk, but this is where we're going to be today. So I'm going to spend time to explain the basis of the judgment, so and the second resurrection, because the first resurrection, as many people always claim, is not the first resurrection is not the retro, resurrection of the entire human race. The first resurrection is the resurrection of only the saints and those who died in the righteous death, and these people are king and are they righteous people in the second resurrection? Yes. But they live and die under the law. So they will be judged by the law. And the Bible makes it clear to us that those who will be judged by the law will help. Because the law does not find any man innocent. But those who took part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. They are not judged based on the law. They are judged by grace. That's what Paul was explaining to us in Corinthians. That those of us who live by grace shall be judged by grace. And those who live by the law shall perish under the law. So if you, as a believer, you put yourself in the category of being observant to the law, you will be judged by the law. And I don't pray any one of us should be judged by the law. Because even Moses was not found innocent under the law. But you can only be saved by grace. So if you are judged by grace, you will be saved by grace. And that grace is the blood of Christ. So you don't have to pay for your sin by your own blood or by doing what is right. Remember what the Bible tells us, all our righteousness are there. It has made me as right before God. So there is no amount of good deeds or righteous deeds we're going to do to save our lives as believers. The only thing we can rely upon is the finished work on the cross of Calvary. That blood that was shed for the remission of sin. And the blood of Christ is the only blood that can make intercession for us in line with the will of God. Brethren, tonight, God is telling you one thing and one thing only. If you come to God, harden not your heart, as it was in the days of temptation, when your father heard his word, 40 years in the wilderness, he was wrought with that temptation. And he swore in his wrath, saying, these are children that do to us. And as a result, they will not enter into my rest. The fact that he said they will not enter in means some of them entered in. Many did not enter because of unbelief. Next, dear, be careful so that the still laws of unbelief do not prevent you from accessing God's rest. As believers, we have opportunity to either save our life by coming under the umbrellas of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and accepting his blood for the remission of our sin. Or we can be ready to risk eternal judgment by waiting for the second death. Here we'll be judged according to our own righteousness. Because the Bible makes it clear to us if we say we have no sin, we are in life. And the truth is not in us. Because all of us have sinned and we fall short under the glory of God. That's why God commended his love to us. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. He the just for us, the unjust. That through him and through his finished work on the cross, we may assess righteousness. That is freely given us in Christ. Brethren, today is the acceptance of blood. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. The choice is yours. Do you want to be saved and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And by so doing, your iniquity is blotted out? Or do you want to risk eternal judgment in a place where the one does not die? Where your flesh is not consumed? Where you live in perpetual desolation, like the Antichrist, are you going to be thrown into the lake of fire that is not prepared for man, that is prepared for the devil and his angels? Where the Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into, and even the devil join them a thousand years later. Is that the place you want to make your home forever? Remember, after a thousand years, this Antichrist and the false prophet were not dead, they were still there. When the devil joined them. And so will all they be there when all the remaining ungodly sinners will be thrown there for eternity. Brethren, you are immortal. Whether you like it or not, death is not the end of your life. After death, there's still a long life ahead of you. God has put his spirit within you. That makes you immortal. The flesh is just dust. He's going to polish away. The flesh does not feel pain. It does not feel sorrow. It does not feel anything. Because though you think you feel it, it is not the flesh, it's the spirit. Go to the mortuary. Pinch a dead man or a dead woman and see if he or she feels anything. That will show you that the flesh is nothing but just dust and ashes. But it is the spirit within you that feels all those things. It is the spirit that feels suffering, that feels hunger. That feel shame, that feel humiliated. If you don't feel the spirit now, is it when it is too late that you're going to feel the spirit? Today is the day of salvation. This word was not given to threaten anyone. This word was given to save life now. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. Just accept God today into your life, and your iniquity will be blotted out. Your sins will be forgiven. If you are ready to do that, my friend. Brethren, in this short prayer, by saying, Lord, I come to you today. I understand your love. I don't want to be part of those that we face the second death every time. But I want to be among the chosen saints who the second death has no power. Oh Lord, I want to be among the chosen saints. So I accept your son died for me on the cross. And because of his blood, was shared for me for the remission of my sins. Now I have set him into my life and I said, Father, draw me to yourself so that I can be part of those you have chosen to live a righteous life and be your children. This I ask through Jesus Christ, my Lord. If you have just said this short prayer, that means you have guaranteed yourself salvation. Write to us. Contact us by every means you can so that we can help you by sending you a book, which is Salvation Guide. It will be a guide to your salvation, to expose the truth to you, to show you what you need to know about the kingdom of God and about his kingdom. Brethren, before we pray, I want to tell you, if you miss any part of this video, and because today we did not continue to start on time, you can still check this video on our website at cgfnsblog.com. cgfnsblog.com. Or you can go to Facebook or YouTube, but we are going to be uploading this video because we do not get live. God bless you as you participate in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you participate in watching this video. We hope to see you next week. Our website is cgfnsblog.com.